Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by MMA veteran Travis Few. Travis, how are you? I'm doing pretty pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Travis, you got a fight coming up May 24th at Driller Promotions No Mercy. How's training been going for the fight? Training's going really well. I feel good. Um, I'm coming off a fight that I just had in April, so i um, been training pretty consistently, and, and, uh, and I feel really good. Just curious, where are you training at nowadays? You know, I, I train with a, a small group of guys uh, here in Minnesota. Um, you know, I got obviously it's easy to, to get a hold of good wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Um, being that it's Minnesota, we, we produce a lot of good wrestlers. So I work out with a, uh, a kid that just graduated high school. And he's actually attending the um, University of Iowa next year, um, wrestling for them. He's a two-time state champion and a, uh, a world medalist in, in Greco. Uh, his name's Sam Stoll, and, and he's one of my training partners. Um, I work out with a couple of uh, um, pro boxers. Um, I, I've got a jiu-jitsu guy who's a, who's a black belt. Um, he, 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 I've been with him for about 10 years. He, he grew up in Brazil. He's pretty legit. His name is Mario Roberto. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been with him a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm a brown belt under him. And I do my jiu-jitsu with him. And he's one of the, the best ground guys I've, I've, I've worked with. And I've worked with a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of ground people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got a good group. It, it's small and it, it's not, it's not, it doesn't consist of a lot of big names that people know of, but, um, they definitely get me ready. Um, the guy I kind of have in charge of all my training overall is Jamie Height. He's a uh, wrestling coach, but he's um, he's from Iowa, and he's a former former University of Iowa wrestler. He was an All-American down there. He wrestled under Coach Gable, mm-hmm. and he does a great job of, of peaking, peaking me and getting me ready, and, and uh, I'm pretty fortunate to have all those guys. Mm-hmm. So basically, you've adopted the boxing style training camp rather than the traditional MMA training camp that we see. Well, you know, not really. Um, I, I, Sam, one of my training partners, um, he's got a couple big tournaments coming up, so you know, he's he's always getting ready, and and, and I, I coached him through the wrestling season this, the, the past couple winters, so he kind of in return helps me get ready. Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't ever really think of it as a training camp. Like I, I train all the time. You know, right. I work out all the time. I don't really think. I, I don't really consider it a training camp where I, I take off for X number of weeks or months, and then eight weeks prior to a fight, I, I get myself ready. I'm just. I'm always training. I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's never. It's never really a, a training camp. It's more just working out. Like I. I, I love working out. I love wrestling I, and jiu-jitsu and, and boxing, and I still enjoy learning new things. So I'm always trying to, to better myself. Mm-hmm. Throughout your career, because you've fought very consistently, basically since you've started, you've had a ton of fights throughout your career. Um, how many of how many of those fights would you say you've had the, the quote training camp where you've had like anywhere from five to eight weeks? That's kind of the the standard people claim when uh, for a training yeah, camp. Yeah, when I when I was younger, I used to do that a lot. You know, mm-hmm. I kind of kind of just did what everybody else was doing, and, and that's what everybody else was doing probably you know six seven years ago, and. Um, and then for some people that may work, you know, I'm not saying that it doesn't work. You know, obviously for a lot of people it does. Um, but for me, what, especially as I get older and, and I continue to, to do this, um, it, it's important for me, especially as far as taking care of my body of, of doing something every day. I mean, even if it's not, um, going hard, even if it's just a uh, sauna, hot tub stretch kind of workout, just doing something every day, I've, I've noticed is, is the huge difference when you get older, is you, you got to you gotta take care of your body. Mm-hmm. How long have you been with the current group of guys that you're training with now? You know, when was the last time you were part of a, a big team? This, this is honestly, I mean, I haven't been with them long, um, probably less than a year, um, less, maybe six months, maybe even less than that, maybe mm-hmm. since probably the beginning of the year. And um, it, it's not a coincidence that I, I feel I feel great. I mean, physically, mentally, it's, it's the 
best I've been in a long time, and, and a lot of that is tribute to uh, Jamie Height. He's the he's the guy that I have kind of running all my workouts, telling me what to do, telling me not what to do, telling me when to take a day off, um, things like that. He's he you know he wrestled uh, under Gable. He learned a lot down there, and and, and he's brought you know, things up here to Minnesota, and uh, it's been a huge benefit for me. Mm -hmm. What brought on the change? Was it because you, you fell on, you know, a little bit of a losing streak there, you lost four fights in a row, was it was it the, the things that were happening in the cage, or was it something where, uh, you know, you just have to do this now because you want to keep prolonging your career, continue to stay healthy, continue to do this? Is it more like outside the cage stuff, or was it results of some fights? No, you nailed it, that's exactly it. You know, I lost four fights in a row, and... Um, First of all, I got too heavy. You know, I, I was fighting at like 260, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I just don't fight well. I, I I just don't fight well, period. I don't fight well when I'm at 260 or 250. You know, I need to be lighter, more athletic. If I'm going to even be at heavyweight, I, I think I fight better at light heavyweight. Obviously, it's a, right. it's a tough cut for me, um, but... If I'm if I'm going to do anything at a, at a at a higher level at a bigger show, it's got to be at light heavyweight, mm -hmm. and, and that was my first my first step is getting my weight down there. Mm -hmm. there. There's no reason for me to be 260, even if I am going to fight heavyweight. Right. Um, so first of all, I got my weight down there. Um, got back down to like 230, 240. Um, my last fight in April was at 215. And that was a pretty easy cut for me. Um, it, it, that was the first step. And then just, uh, you know, I started to question my chin. Like maybe maybe I'd taken, taken too many shots. Maybe maybe I was getting a little punchy, you know. Maybe maybe uh, my my brain wasn't recovering like, like it properly should. And I looked at those four losses that I had in a row, and I was doing the exact same thing in every fight. I, I wasn't moving my feet. I wasn't moving my head. My, my chin wasn't my my chin wasn't tucked. Uh, my hands weren't up. I mean, it's pretty easily pretty easy to get knocked out when you're not doing those things. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, right. I, I was basically just a punching bag, and, mm -hmm. and I was fighting at heavyweight. And heavyweights hit hard, and, right. and, uh, and I was just standing there, not moving. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm going to get rocked. I'm going to get rocked hard when I'm not doing those things that I properly should. Mm -hmm. So I look at it, and I'm like, I just got to get back to where I was fighting. And the first step of that is getting my weight down where I, I'm more agile, I'm quick, and, and more athletic, and and then just um, just moving more, moving my feet more, moving my head more, keeping my chin tucked, just basic things that uh, maybe I forgot to do, maybe I got lazy, but um, it was basically a combination of all those things. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a weird pattern, some of these losses you've had, because they've all come like under 30 seconds. The Vague yep. fight, the yep. Mike Kyle fight, the Ryan Martinez fight. It almost seemed like when you got in the cage, you, you, you were ready to fight, but when the bell rung, you just, for whatever reason, didn't respond. You know, what exactly were you feeling in some of these fights? Because it's very weird that we see a guy lose the, the way you've lost so quickly. Uh, it's, it's very uh, different than some of these other guys who have suffered knockout losses. It almost seems like you just keep getting caught not so much of your your technique i mean yeah your technique you said was not up to par but it's it's not like um you know you can't take a punch anymore it's just kind of you you've just been caught cold you know that's that's what i kind of thought it was is i just couldn't take a punch anymore right. and, and you know then i went back and looked at them and, and like i was saying I was, I was doing the same thing and everything wasn't mm -hmm. moving i wasn't doing the things that that, that make me successful as a fighter i mean ryan martinez is a perfect example that guy hits hard right if you just stand in right front of him mm -hmm. and, and you don't tuck your chin and you don't put your hands up and you don't have a little head movement yeah i mean he almost took my head off i mean that was the worst i had been knocked out ever i mean right. and in the kyle fight the same thing you know i mean i i, I took that on short notice about a week's notice and i think i actually even had to cut to make 265 for that one i mean and, just, and there's no excuses. I mean, I just lazy and, and 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 not training like I should have been, and not eating like I should have been, and and it was a combination of everything, and and just moving better. You know, I, I wasn't moving, and like I was saying, if I was basically a standing punching bag out mm -hmm. there, and, and that's not fun. Mm -hmm. 
the only fight in that four fight losing streak that you had, it was a fight that you had in Abu Dhabi. Um, you lost the fight by split decision. Some people say that you actually did enough to win that fight. Uh, what do you say? Do you think you did enough in that fight? Yeah, I definitely think I did enough. Um, that night, I mean, I thought it was completely screwed. Like, that was the worst decision I'd I'd ever seen. I mean, I thought I I dominated the fight. Obviously, when I go back and look at the fight, it, it wasn't as one-sided as I thought, but I still thought I did enough to win the fight. Um, but, I mean, that that's how it goes. I can never... I mean, it would, and now that I look at it, it was, it was a close fight, but, I mean, I, I thought I, I thought I did enough to win. Mm-hmm. You brought up your weight, and you said that you were you were fighting some of these fights, cutting to 265 or fighting at 260. It seems like the best weight for a heavyweight is anywhere from like 235 to 240. Look at these guys, Cain Velasquez, Mauricio Verdum, all the, all the top guys in the UFC at heavyweight. They're walking around, uh, you know, way under 265, and they're not cutting that much. They're all in that that very good weight where you can have some cardio but also have some size with you. Um, is that kind of some of those guys that you've looked at and been like, all right, this is the way to go? Because it used to be a couple years ago, Brock Lesnar, you know, the giant that he is, you know, 265 cutting to make that weight. Um, a lot of people were packing on size, but that uh, doesn't seem to translate uh, for everyone. Um, is it, Are those some of the guys that you've looked at, the the Verdums, the Velasquez, and everybody, like, you know, this is the perfect size to be? Yeah, you nailed it again. You're, you're right on the money. I mean, I, I, I call it the Brock Lesnar syndrome, and right. I fell into it, like... I wanted to get big and strong, and I wanted to be Brock Lesnar. I mean, I wanted to fight like him, and, and there's only one Brock Lesnar. I mean, mm-hmm. let's face it, that guy's a freak of nature. I mean, yeah. there's there's only one. And then me getting that heavy, that's exactly what I was trying to do, and it, it just doesn't work for 99% of, of athletes, of humans, you know, and nobody's going to be athletic as, as him. And But, yeah, I, that's what exactly what I looked at is I looked at Kane. I mean, the guy's... 240 and he moves and moves great obviously great head motion his hands are good his feet are always moving and his cardio is ridiculous so um, that, that, that was a, a perfect example of somebody that if I'm going to fight at heavyweight um, you know that, that, that's who I need to mimic my game after mm-hmm. during this four fight losing streak did you ever have thoughts about retirement oh absolutely I mean especially when I thought my chin was gone I mm-hmm. I, I thought yeah, you know, I, I couldn't even... Because, again, the Mike Kyle fight, I mean, he didn't even hit me in the chin. He, right. like, Behind the ear. head yeah. with his forearm. He, yeah. like, threw a hook, and it just clipped me. Mm-hmm. And it just, it rocked me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it didn't rock me, but it, it, it um... Knocked it, it off your equi- off equi- Yeah, knocked off your equilibrium, yeah. yeah. He yeah, caught you with kind of like a, a the, wrist. Like I said, the yeah. Ryan Martinez loss was... Yeah. I mean, that was a horrible knockout. I, I don't... I didn't remember anything. I didn't remember who I was, any of my family, where I was. I mean, that's a, that's the type of knockout where you start to consider if, if you should do this any longer. And then, you know, but then yeah, before that, I had the the the, uh, the fight in Abu Dhabi. And then before that, I was the the first of those four losses was um, in the Bellator final right. against the Tila Vey. Right. And kind of the same thing. He just he he called me behind the ear and and, and knocked me out. And yeah, after three out of the four losses were, were knockouts, I was definitely considering you know maybe I need to to move on and and start thinking about my health. And then that's when I started looking at things and realized I was just doing everything wrong. It's not that my chin is gone. It's just. If I'm going to fight like that, I'm, I'm going to get knocked out. Anybody is. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned the part about your chin, uh, about retirement. You didn't know if you still had it, but um, when you when you were thinking about, you know, maybe maybe should should I hang it up? Should I not hang it up? You know, what am I going to do? Um, were you ever like really confused, like like what happened to me? Because you know, a couple fights before you fought Mike Kyle, you were fighting vague in the tournament final, and if you win that fight, you're fighting for the world title against the guy you had already beaten, Christian and Pumbu. So were you like, you know, how did this all spiral out of control so fast? Absolutely, that's exactly what I thought. Is I wasn't too far away from being the Bellator light heavyweight champion. Um, you know, I, I I thought I matched up really well against Bay, and um, I'd, I'd beaten Mupambu, and you know, Bay caught me, and then Bay went on and fought Mupambu, and they pretty much controlled Mupambu on the ground, and then I knew I could have did that, and I, I I did do that for three rounds. So yeah, I, that. That definitely was uh, was crossing my mind. Is 
how did things go turn so quickly? Mm-hmm. And um, when I was fighting Bellator in 2012, it would have been, and, and making that nice run at light heavyweight, you know, I was I was doing the things I needed to do. I was, I was fighting at a lighter weight. I was moving forward, creating pressure, moving my feet, and I, man, I, I got lazy and I got fat, mm-hmm. and I, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. That was such a great run you were on in 2012. Uh, you had beat in Pumbo in a non-title bout, and then you you were tearing through that tournament. You also won a fight before you got into the tournament, uh, in between the Pumbo fight and when you fought in the first round of the Bellator tournament. You were on that great run. Um, was that like the lowest point of your career, the, the vague loss, or was there another uh, point in your career where you, you felt you know worse than that? Probably the lowest I point was after the Martinez loss, mm-hmm. um, just because I was coming back into the tournament. I think that was the first round of a heavyweight tournament. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was like a summer yeah. series tournament. Yeah, or and uh, I I made the decision to move back up to heavyweight, which at the time I thought was the right decision. And and um, I mean, he he knocked me out in 18 seconds, I think, and. And that, that might have been the lowest point. But they lost. I mean, I, I think he caught me, you know, a little yeah, bit. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. I think it, style wise, it was a good matchup for me. Um, I, 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 I think the Martinez loss might have been the lowest. Obviously, the Babalu loss way back. In, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll yeah. see that that was a low point. Uh, but I, I might say the Martinez loss. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, especially the way I lost, it, it, the, the knockout was really bad where it made me start to consider things, and I definitely said that was the, the lowest point. Mm-hmm. What exactly brought you back? I mean, you, you said that you were on the fence. Should I should I leave the sport? Should I continue to fight? You know, what pushed you to, to continue to fight? Um, well, you know, I, I think... At the time, I had 68 wins. I thought, well, it'd be cool to get to 70. Mm-hmm. And I, I know, you know, I think there's only a couple guys that've gotten 70 wins. So I was like, I'll get to 70, and then we'll see how it goes. And then I fought New Year's Eve um, last year, um, and it has been a pretty tough opponent here in Minnesota. Um, Brett Murphy is his yep, name, that's right. and um, he, he's young, but he's going to do well in the sport. And that was a heavyweight, and I, and I wanted a decision there, and, and that kind of got just the blood flowing again. You know that that feeling of winning a fight is is incredible. Like it, nothing matches it. Like that night, that next day, the next week, like you're just you're literally floating. Like the, the feeling of winning a fight. Is unbelievable, and, and I, I got that feeling back. And then I fought again in April, and against a, a, a decent opponent. You know, he was a Bellator veteran, uh, Terry Davini. Um, had a win, uh, a real quick knockout in, in Bellator, and then had a couple other wins against UFC guys. And that fight went well. That was at um, two fifteen, and and I fight pretty well when when I'm at that lower weight class, and and that even got the ball rolling faster mm-hmm. and um, now I got this coming up May 24th and then and I got a couple potential things lined up after that so the ball just keep the ball rolling I just you know that the feeling of winning a fight is incredible and it'll, it'll definitely motivate you mm-hmm. Travis I'm absolutely fascinated by guys like you and Travis Fulton and Dan Severn and Jeremy Horn and all these guys who have fought a ton in their career because it's so it's so hard to remain healthy all this time. Like you, you look at a guy like Tito, he's, Tito Ortiz. He's fighting this weekend. He's completely uh, he, he's got more metal in him than the Terminator. He's got a neck problem, back problem, knee problem. Every everything's got a shoulder problem. Everything's got a problem. And you've been able to remain healthy all this time, and you've got um, seventy wins, I think eighteen losses, and one no contest. Yeah, Eighty nine fights. You've been fighting uh, since two thousand one. You've been in this game for a very long time. How have you been able to remain in one piece? How have you been able to to keep fighting after all these fights? You know, it's a good question. Um, I, I I don't really have it a secret. You know, oh, yeah. 
Um, it's all about taking care of your body and um, putting the right things in it. I think one thing that's, that's helped me is, is I've, I've never drank alcohol or I drank alcohol one time in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's helped me. I've never did any drugs, um, never smoked anything, did anything like that. So I've, you know, I've, that's just poison you're putting in your body. I've never did anything like that. I think that's been one of the keys um, to me staying healthy, um, being smart when it comes to your training. And especially as I the older I get, um, kind of forcing myself to take days off and, and, and take recovery days and kind of have like recovery workouts, um, things like that, and just listening to your body and, and, and understanding. I mean, when I was 26, yeah, probably 26, 27, I was training down in Militich, and, and I'm sure you've heard the stories everybody has. I mean, those days were brutal. Like, oh, yeah. Kill each other. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I, wasn't, exactly. I wasn't there really in the in the heat of it, but, I, you know, I'd, I'd be down there occasionally. And, and all those true, all those stories they say are true. I mean, those guys mm-hmm. would kill each other on a, on a week, on a, on a nightly basis. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence because a lot of those guys aren't fighting anymore. I think, you know, Robbie, Jeremy, there's a couple of them, but... You know, a lot of those guys aren't around anymore, and, and I think that's why is you gotta you gotta take care of your body, and, and you gotta listen to it, and give it the proper nutrition, and, and and give it the proper rest, and and a lot of it is luck as well. You know, I mean, it's just plain old luck. You gotta you gotta listen to your body. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, I'm absolutely fascinated with uh, your career because you've been able to fight as many fights as you've had, and you're, and you're still going strong. You know, 12, 13 years, whatever it may be, uh, into your career, you're still you're still in, in the game, and and you fought a bunch of times. So I'm very fascinated by this. Um, I just have a question: um, Is there anybody you won't fight? Um, I, I think in, in let's see, I've been doing this 13 years. I, I think I've turned down two fights, and that was 13 years. Um, like in 2003, no, it must have been 2004, about 10 years ago. Um, they wanted me to fight Alexander Emelianenko in Russia, and I said no to that because at the time he was he was killing people. Mm-hmm. Um, I said no to that, and then in 2012 they wanted me to fight. Um, Bellator wanted me to fight. Um, Cole, it must have been 2010. They wanted me to fight Cole Conrad, mm-hmm. and I mean that was just a horrible style matchup for me. And there's Cole's actually I worked out with him quite a bit, and uh, I was thankful I didn't take the fight because he was he was awesome, and it was a horrible style matchup for me. And there's nothing I was going to do to him that um, he wouldn't stop. So in, in 12, 13 years, those are the two fights I've turned down. So other than that, I. I've, I've said yes just about everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there's nobody out there right now that if I offer you a fight or, you know, like let's say I'm a promoter, I offer you a fight, you you won't, you won't would turn that down? Like is there anybody out there, like a, a teammate, a former teammate, a friend, anybody out there? Uh, that, no, no, as far as like teammates, a friend, I'd, I'd fight. You know, I'd, I'm, I'm very um, good, I guess I'd say it. it it's separating the, the friendship from the business part and, and I'd, I'd have no problems stepping in fighting a teammate or fighting a quote-unquote friend. Mm-hmm. I mean, we both understand it's just business, and I'm making him some money, and he's making me some money by stepping in there. And, and um, I mean, Travis Fulton's a perfect example. I fought him three times, and, and I consider him a very good friend. And, um, yeah, I mean, we'd, I'd have no problem stepping in there and fighting with him again and then, and then going buying him dinner afterwards. You know, it's just part of the business. Mm-hmm. 70 wins, 18 losses, one no contest. Is that record accurate? Because I know some of the early days, you know, the databases weren't really uh, up to date. So is that an accurate record? No, I probably have 10 to 15 fights. Actually, when Travis Fulton was promoting shows in Minnesota, um, he was promoting shows in my in my hometown, which is Owatonna, and he was doing a weekly show there. And it, it was obviously before Minnesota had an athletic commission. And, um, I mean, we would just show up and then we would just fight each other. I mean, I there would be, I mean, there's probably 10 to 15 fights that, that aren't on there that that we we did that type of thing there's a couple of times where there wasn't enough people to to put them the ring up so we would just roll a mat out 
like mm-hmm. on the bar floor, right. <laughs> and we would just fight out like a wrestling mat. Right. You know, and I don't know how how sanctioned or professional or whatever you want to say it was, but it it it, uh, it was pretty different back then. Mm-hmm. Just curious, how many times were you stiffed by a promoter? Because you have all these fights. There's got to be a handful of times that you haven't received payment for. You know, honestly, I'm trying to think. Never. Really? I've always gotten paid. I've been fortunate. Where one thing I'm very fortunate is that I have Monty Cox as my manager, mm-hmm. and yep. people are smart enough to know. Um, you know, you don't screw over Monty Cox in the sport of mixed martial arts. Right. So I'm very fortunate to have him. I've had him for 11 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been with him a long time. Um, back in those smaller, back in those those first few years I was fighting, I, I didn't even know we were getting, we could get paid. You know, and be, right. 10 or 15 or whatever fights I had, I, I didn't even think we could get paid. I didn't realize there was money involved. And then mm-hmm. somebody finally told me or asked me how much I was getting paid. And I was like, getting paid? I didn't know we could get paid to do this. <laughs> right. And then, you know, I started to branch out and, and do some more regional things. But, um, I mean, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I've been fortunate, and I think a lot of it has to do with, with being with Monty because mm-hmm. obviously everybody knows Monty in the sport right. and knows not to mm-hmm. screw him over. Right. What are some of your big, if you don't mind ask, or if, if you don't mind me asking, what are some of your biggest paydays in the sport? You know, it's kind of funny. I, I think people think they're a lot bigger than they are. When I was fighting in Japan, right? Um, I fought in I fought over three times. Each fight was fifty grand. Um, you know, the, a lot of people make fun of the Yama thing that I that I won yeah. the Yama tournament <laughs> right. in, in New Jersey. Right. Yep. That was a great night for me. Like yeah. they paid me like thirty grand, and then that's what um, propelled me to fight in Japan, right? Because I beat Rico Rodriguez, right? And in Japan, had 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 known about that. Um, so that was a good night, even though people people criticize that and make fun of it a lot. It was, it was a good night for me. Um, I've had a lot of those, you know, 15 to 20 grand fights. And, and I've been on the opposite end where I've, I've had a lot of those $1,000 fights. Mm-hmm. So right. it, it's in that range. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, two things about Yama. Um, how did they pay you for this tournament? Obviously, you fought three times in a single night. Um, do they pay you a flat rate if you if you make it to the tournament, or is it like fight by fight basis? You know, how do they do that payment wise? It was fight by fight, and then um, then I won it, and then they um, I think it, yeah, it was twenty five grand to win it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean that was, that was a good night for me. Mm-hmm. And also, what did you do with the belt? Where's that at nowadays? That's a great question. Like, <laughs> I lost the belt. That's what? Like, yeah, it's like my my biggest like setback. I I had it. I gave it to this bar in oh, no. Rochester, Minnesota, to put up, and they put it up on the wall, and it looked really nice, and they put it in a nice frame with my picture, and it was really cool. And then the bar closed, and. Now it's been like two years, and I cannot find it. Like I've, I've contacted people, and my wife has contacted, my dad's contacted people. Like I, it's probably sitting in like some basement. Who knows where it is? I, but yeah, it's like the one I, I got a bunch of belts down in my claw or down in my basement right now. And but the one belt that was probably meant the most, the Ama belt. I don't even know where it is. Oh my god, that's, I that's know, terrible. I'm me. depressed now. Horrible. I'm depressed. I gotta find that thing. Yeah, that's if there was, you know, ever a, a Hall of Fame in the future, that's definitely <laughs> gonna be hanging there. Now we don't even know where it is. It could be, you know, who knows? It could be lying in someone's garage somewhere, collecting yeah, dust sure or rusted it out. Know, it's not like somebody's probably, you know, showing it off. Yeah. it wasn't that big a deal. But right. I, I have no idea where it's at. Oh man. I mean, you, you hit it on the head. You know, a lot of people uh, criticize that tournament, but it's a really good tournament. If you look at the names who are in it, it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great tournament. I mean, so the, the guy I fought in the finals, uh, Chris Tusher, went oh, out yeah? and fought in the UFC. Fought in the UFC. Had a couple of wins. Um, Rico was in it. Mm-hmm. Um, that that guy that he's in the UFC. Um, his name's like Alexi Olenek. Um, he. he, he he submitted Miracle a couple of fights or a couple months ago. Um, he was in the tournament. Um, there, there are some tough guys in that tournament. Oh. I mean, yeah, a lot of people make fun of that Yama, mm-hmm. but it, it wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. Wasn't Sherman Pendergrass? Wasn't he in that? Sherman, tournament? Yep, yeah, Sherman mm-hmm. was in right. it. Um, the, the Brazilian that I fought in the first round, um, he was undefeated at the time. 
there. And um, he, he, I think he's went on. I mean, he's he's won some fights, mm-hmm. and, and he was decent. Marcelo per- yeah. Pereira or something. I don't. I don't remember yeah. how to say his last name. But yeah, I I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and they had those super fights too. They had like the legends division. They had like uh, Olag Tektarov fought like yep. Mark Kerr. Yeah, that was a, that was a good card. I don't know. I mean, I think it was that whole bull thing or what pit yep. or whatever they call. It. I think yep. that's what got a bad rap. But it was a really good show. I mean, but I'm the wrong guy to talk to because I I love everything. You know, I'm a. Yeah. I'm an MMA yeah. junkie. I'm and the wrong guy. Honest, the fact that they didn't do anything further. Yeah. You know, if they yeah. would have did a few more right. shows, mm-hmm. um, you know, but they're obviously one and done. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I think uh, Pat Smith fought Butterbean. Right. And, and That's right. Yeah. That, 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 mm-hmm. uh, I just remember it not looking very good. Um, but I don't know. I, I had a good night. Yeah. Yeah. That's a... Definitely a, a good tournament, and I, I wish you could find that belt because that's something to be very try. proud of. Yeah. Every time I talk about it, I'm like, I gotta find that belt. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, I'm, I'm just curious, um, how many of these fights that you had in your career did somebody, you know, pull you from the crowd and put you in there? Because we've heard all these stories about, oh, this guy just showed up on an hour's notice and fought. Was there ever a time throughout your career where you were the guy who came out of the crowd and fought, or you had no opponent and someone came out of the crowd and, and fought you? Was there ever a time like that? Yeah, I've had quite a few of those, actually. Um, mm-hmm. Never where I've came out of the crowd, but um, Brad Kohler um, mm-hmm. was promoting shows in Minnesota. Right. That's kind of how I got started in the whole thing, is I met him and and he was doing shows all over Minnesota. And um, I fought for him a couple of times, and, and, and we kind of became like a traveling circus where we would, during the week, we would travel around like Minneapolis, Twin Cities, um, St. Paul, wherever we could find a small town. And again, this was before Minnesota was, was sanctioned with an athletic commission. Um, we would travel like around town, try to find these, find these little suburbs and, and, and a little bar where we could set up a ring and, and so we'd do that. We'd, go, we'd come into the town Friday night or Saturday night. We'd set up the ring, and he'd have a few fights lined up or whatever. And then he would he would have one opponent lined up for me, and obviously they were just bums. I mean, literally. Mm-hmm. Some of them may have been literally bums, but um, guys that didn't train, didn't do anything. Um, so I'd go in the ring. You know, they'd announce him. They'd announce me. I'd go in, I'd fight him, I'd beat him. And then I'd stay in the ring, and Kohler would get on the mic, and he'd be like, uh, anybody in this crowd that thinks they can beat this guy right here, um, I'll, I'll give you a thousand dollars. And you know, I'd, there'd guys that would jump up, and and I'd, I'd fight two or three guys right in a row. And obviously, Kohler didn't have a thousand dollars to give him, right. but um, I, I didn't lost any of them. But I mean, there was a couple nights where we did that. It was, it was basically like a traveling circus. We would just cruise around town and then or cruise around Minneapolis, Twin Cities and find a show and or find a bar and then do a show. Mm-hmm. How many tournaments, one night tournaments, have you fought in over the course of your career? Because uh, there's a lot of fights uh, on your record that happen the same day as, as other fights. So how many of these are tournaments, and how, are, how many of these are the the Brad Kohler uh, you know challenges to the crowd? How many of these uh, are tournaments? I probably did. Oh, probably five or six tournaments. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, I see. And is that something that you know you're hoping that somebody would do more often? Have a lot of those fights because your guy who loves to be very active. So is that yeah, something that you're I, open to? I, I was reading on the underground that um, Oklahoma, yeah, Kenny um, Monday is, show. is doing yep. those again, mm-hmm. and um, I, I know they're. I think it's like one seventy yep. or one eighty five. They're doing yep. first, or the, that's the one I read about. But yep, one seventy. And if they ever did do a light heavyweight or. or even a heavyweight one, that's definitely something I would, I would love to be involved in because I feel very comfortable doing those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Kenny Monday's show, Battleground MMA. Yeah, exactly. Dennis yep. Hallman's, yep. Dennis I'd Hallman's love to get fighting. Involved in that. Yeah, Dennis Hallman's fighting on a, in that yep. tournament. Yep. Yeah. Um, just curious, you fought for victory uh, throughout your career, and victory. Um, Put on the best fight that people have never seen. Uh, Josh Near versus uh, Spencer yep. Fisher. Were you at that yep. fight? Did you fight on that card, or were you just? No, I wasn't. But I've, I've, I've seen the video and I've heard about it. Right. Okay. Okay. Just curious. Just curious. Yeah. 
Um, now, you fought Vladimir Matsushenko at UFC 40. Then you went a couple of years, and then you were brought back at UFC 52, and you fought against Babalu. I'm just curious, why that huge gap between uh, Matsushenko and Babalu? What was going on back then? Was it still just, you know, they were doing those one-fight deals, and you lost, and they just chose not to re-sign you? Or was it just they were so disappointed with those performances that they didn't bring you back? You know, what exactly was going on? Because you went on a tear after you lost to Matsushenko, and, you know, you would think that they would have brought you back before UFC 52, but, you know, what, what was the story there? Um, uh, from what I remember is, as I fought um, Vladdy, I, I took the fight on like 10 days notice. He was supposed to fight Meter, and Meter got injured. And um, I stepped in and, and fought. And I know it was about a week, 10 day notice. And um, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I had no, no business being in there. I, I didn't know anything back then. I'd just been trained. I'd probably been training only three or four months. Um, just getting involved in the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, at that point, you don't say no to the UFC. So I took right. that fight, and that didn't go well, and I didn't perform well. And then, yeah, I went I went on a good run and then came back with the Bob Blue fight, and uh, I fought pretty well in the first round. Um, it was kind of back and forth. He had a couple takedowns. I had a couple takedowns uh, with a little ground and pound, and, and then he caught me with the, with the arm bar in the second round. And... Um, yeah, you know, that's a good question. I, I, I never, never heard much. Any, you mm-hmm. know, I had a good, good run in, in Japan and, right. and um, some other places. And um, I don't know. You know, at this point in my career, it, it's not, it's not a, it's not a goal. Mm-hmm. You know, they're right. they're not looking for a a thirty six year old guy with eighty nine fights. Right. And, you know, they, they're not looking for an old dog like me. They want a, a young kid that's 10 and 0 with nine knockouts. So um, those might be my only two fights in the UFC. Right. But um, yeah, I'm not really sure why I didn't get a yeah. call back. Mm-hmm. Uh, just curious, you fought James Lee at Pride 33, and that was the second to last Pride show. And then, of course, uh, the UFC bought them. Uh, did that fight factor into them not giving you another chance? Do you think? Um, I'm sure it did. I mean, you know, we were talking about lowest points in, in my career. That was definitely uh, maybe not the lowest, but it's pretty close. Uh, that was the same thing. Like he, I was supposed to fight um, not Nazi. I wasn't supposed to fight James Lee. I was supposed to fight somebody else. And like three or was four it, days um, prior to the fight, was it Nakamura? Fighting, yeah, I think yeah. I was supposed to fight Nakamura. Okay. And three or four. Not, I can't remember. No, it wasn't. It was not. It was um, the Korean that was at him. I can't remember. Okay. I think it was Nakamura. Okay. And three or four days prior to the weigh-ins, um, he got hurt, and and they brought James Lee in, and I just I wasn't ready for him. I didn't I didn't know he was a southpaw. Um, James was very good on the ground. I I wasn't prepared for that. Um, that's uh, he, he actually we were at 205 um, and he couldn't make the weight but we thought it would look good to pride if, if I still made the weight so he weighed in at like 210 mm-hmm. I, I think we agreed to go 210 but right. mm-hmm. we wanted to make it look good for pride that I still made the cut even though I didn't have to so I still cut down to 205 and he weighed in at 210 and then obviously the rest is history he caught me and, and, and submitted me but that was that was definitely another low point in my career where um, I'm sure that had a lot of, lot to do with you know the UFC not not wanting much wanting much to do with me. Mm-hmm. Now that card was a fantastic card. That was also the same night Dan yeah. Anderson captured two belts. He already had the welterweight belt, and yep. then he knocked out Vanderlei Silva to claim the middleweight belt. Um, the the night didn't go your way. Does that like like take away that you are apart from history? Is that something that like you would still tell people uh, even though you didn't win that fight? Like, will you still tell people you know years from now that you are part of that card? Yeah, it, it it was definitely it definitely takes away from the story. You know, mm-hmm. it's definitely not something I brag about. Right. Um, but that was a fantastic card, mm-hmm. and I mean, talk about legends. I mean, that, yeah. That's as, as legendary as it gets, and and you know, obviously Dan Henderson 
maybe became a legend that night. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that knockout was, I can still remember it. You know, yeah. I was, that was awesome. Yeah. And uh, he, he broke his hand. He broke his right hand and knocked him out with a left hook. Yeah, yeah that's right, that's <laughs> yeah. right. So, I mean, that, that's something I'll never forget. Uh-huh. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's not something I brag about mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- that was a great night. Dan Henderson got on the mic after that card, and he said, um, you can come to my after party at I, I, some club in Las Vegas, or you can go to Vandaway's at the hospital. That was, that's such a great <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that was also the same night that Gomi fought Nick Diaz in that oh my gosh. great fight. Yeah. Maybe the best fight I ever seen. Yeah, yeah. It ended up being a no contest, but uh, yep. uh, the video shows that Nick awesome Diaz fight. won. Yeah. Great fight, great fight. That was, that was at the time when Gomi was... Was, uh, it was God, yeah. He was, yeah. He was the, the best guy in the world at that time. Yep, that was a great fight. Yep, definitely, definitely. Now, Travis, you fought all over the world, ranging from the U.S., Canada, Brazil, Japan, all over, really. Abu Dhabi, you, you fought there recently. All over the world, um, you, you've had fights. Uh, what's your favorite place out there for a fight? You know, if you're given the option to fight anywhere in the world, you know, hypothetical, but you're given an option anywhere in the world, where are you fighting? Uh, probably Japan, just because the way you get treated, the way the fans look at you, um, they basically look at uh, look at fighters like like we look at um, as they play in the NFL, mm-hmm. football players. Um, I mean, they just hold you at that status and have so much respect for you. I mean, it, it was definitely I've I'd, I'd heard a lot about it, um, but you don't really um, you don't really realize it until you experience it, mm-hmm. and it, it's it's unbelievable. Right. You hit the Japan scene at the right time because when you were fighting there, you know, it, it, Pride had ended, but Sengoku and Dream, they were going pretty yep. strong. And then when you stopped fighting in Japan, everything crashed. Fighters weren't getting paid, or they they were getting paid, but not the contracted amount. Um, when you when you hear about this, or when you see about how the Japanese scene is, is not what it once was, um, and, and you say that's the fight, you know, that's the place where you'd like to fight uh, if, if you could, um, you know, what does that do to you? You know, how, how disappointing is that 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 scene is not what it once was yeah it's definitely disappointing i mean it was it was a, it was a great opportunity for fighters to experience um professionalism unlike here in the united states you know i mean like i said we fighters got treated like um like professional athletes right. should be treated mm-hmm. and um you know they're still doing a few things over there but obviously it's not nearly as big as right. it used to be and and I, i'm not sure if, if mixed martial arts is right. not as big or what the deal is but um, yeah, it's it's pretty sad that that the, the Japan scene is is mm-hmm. is not as big as it used to be. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. There's still mixed martial arts going on there, but they're not flying guys from the states yeah. over there like they used yep. to. Pancrase Deep, all those shows, they're they're still around, but they're not, uh, you know, having any American talent on that on those cards. Uh, just curious, you fought in the UFC, Pride, Sengoku, Bellator, IFL. Um, King of the Cage, uh, Yama, all, all these different organizations. Um, what one treated you the best? You know, what's the one that you know? If, if they were all still around and, and you were able to fight for them, which one would you pick of, of that group? Uh, that's a good question. Um, honestly, you know, I never, I never got treated poorly. You know, I mean, there's not one that sticks out where I think, man, I, I would hate to fight there again. Or I'd hate to fight for them again. Everybody's always treated me fairly, and, and like I said. It, I have to have to think it has to do with Monty Cox. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as the best, I mean, back when I fought for the UFC, it wasn't nearly as big as right. it used to be. Mm-hmm. Or it's not nearly as yeah. big as it is now. I mean, yep. not even close. Um, I remember when I fought in UFC 40 and UFC 52, they gave us like a like a a bag of like um, five free UFC T-shirts, and everybody thought I was like the biggest thing, like the coolest thing right. ever. Right. And now. Obviously, people would laugh at that if I told them that, you know, right. not that big a deal, five free UFC t-shirts. Um, Pride was cool. Um, um, like I said, Yama, I got treated really well. Um, Abu Dhabi was, was definitely the the most unique place I'd ever fought and, and, and um, kind of a little bit, on edge the whole time just because you know we're we're Americans is me and two other guys my corners and we're 
we're Americans and, and we're looked at a little bit differently over there, um, but never had no problems. We got treated great and, and had a great time and, and got to one of the most unique places in the world. It was an awesome trip mm -hmm. um, besides the fight itself, but um, yeah, I, I can't really, you know, nothing really sticks out as far as being treated the best. I, all I can say is I've, I've never been treated poorly. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Now, um, here's you know a tough question. Uh, actually, a two-parter. First part, who's the toughest guy you've ever fought? And second part, who's the best guy you've ever fought? Uh, the toughest guy. Physically toughest? Yeah. Um, fatty. Um, some of that may have to do with I was just so young and naive, I didn't know a lot. Um, but he, he was he was probably one of the most physically toughest guys that I'd ever fought where I felt like I was helpless out there. Um, the best guy I'd ever fought was probably um, probably Babalu mm -hmm. as far as just an all-around fighter, mm -hmm. all-around good, you know, all-around excellent in, in jiu-jitsu, stand-up, takedowns. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he's probably the, the best fighter I'd ever fought. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you cut out for a second. Who did you say was the toughest guy you fought? Toughest is probably um, probably Vladimir Medvedenko. Oh, okay, okay. And now, um, who, who's a guy out there that um, you know preparing for the fight? You're like, oh, oh man, you know, you know, he, he's really good. I need to be aware of this and this and that. And then when you got in there and fought him, uh, you know, you, you kind of not over, you know, not um, you know, psyched yourself out. But you know, he, he wasn't the guy you thought you were. And then on the other side, who was who was somebody who you thought, you know, man, this is a, a great matchup for me. I'm just gonna roll right over this guy. And then when you got in there, you're like, you know, this is a lot tougher than I, you know, this guy's a lot tougher than I thought. Um, any of those guys come to mind either side? And, yeah, absolutely. The, the guy that, that shocked me the most was, was Fujita. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. I never imagined, I never even thought about knocking him out. I mean, I, I, up until then, nobody even rocked him. And mm -hmm. I knocked him out with a jab. And, I mean, that, I was by far the most shocked person in Saitama Arena that mm -hmm. night. And I think a lot of Japanese people were shocked. And I was by far the most shocked because that just, that didn't happen. You know, I, I knocked Kazuki Fujita with a jab. Um, so that, that was definitely the most shocking. As far as um, what I didn't expect, um, that was a good matchup. But, you know, the Attila Vey kind of comes to mind. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, and nothing taken away from any. He did a, he did a good job, obviously. Um, but I thought I matched up really well with him, and I thought if I could get him to the ground, it would be over, you know, fairly quick. I thought I could outgrapple him and and, and 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 finish him on the ground. And um, you know, he threw a good punch and, and it landed. So I can't say anything about luck, but right. um, that was definitely one fight where I, I was I was pretty confident. I don't think I was overconfident, but I was pretty confident, and, and it didn't go my way. Mm -hmm. Your career has spanned a very long time, and and just be you know just for the simple fact that uh, times have have changed so quickly in this sport. You know, uh, you know, you you came in at two thousand and one, and that's when the UFC started to, to you know the Zufa came in and the Fertitas and Dana White they came in and then uh, changed the the way the sport looks, and then uh, it changed again. And you, you've been around your career has spanned all the major booms uh, in this sport. So uh, the landscape has changed so many times during your career, and and guys who are at the top uh, at one point were at the bottom and then guys who are at the bottom were at the top uh, so there's a lot of different fighters to choose from here but um, whether they're active now or uh, were active during the, the course of your career and, and have now retired um, was there ever a guy that you really wanted to fight that you never got the chance to? Um, yeah there's, there's nobody that really jumps out I'm trying to think um I can't really think of anybody that, mm -hmm. that I really wanted to fight that, that mm -hmm. I didn't get a chance to. Mm -hmm. uh, no, none of those guys, uh, like uh, Randy Couture, Chuck Liddell, uh, Fedor, uh, Pedro Hizzo, and none of those guys? Yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, I can't really think yeah. of the guys that you said are, none, are legends. None of those guys? At that point. Hmm. Okay, okay. I was just curious about that. Um, yep. Anyways, Travis, um, 
uh, you know, you you fought uh, all over the world. You fought uh, all these tough guys. Uh, you, you've had an amazing uh, career, um, and, and you're still going. You know, you, you still said that there's some things uh, out there for you to accomplish. Um, what keeps you motivated to fight? You know, there, there's been a lot of guys who have you know half as many fights as you do, or or you know a quarter amount of fights that you do, who uh, you know haven't been around for that long and, and decided they're you know uh, going to step away from the sport. But you remain strong all this t- all this time. Uh, what keeps you motivated to fight? Um, you know, it's, it's that um, feeling of winning a fight. It, it's mm-hmm. it's indescribable, and it's it's uh, something I can't. If I could find something that's comparable to it, I, I probably quit the sport a long time ago. But it's a uh, it's an awesome feeling. Um, you know, to train hard for you know a number of weeks or, or months or whatever it is and, and go out and perform well and um, I've always enjoyed the competition and um, you know I still feel good you yeah. know and um, it, I still enjoy the training and I still enjoy learning new things and working hard and, and, and going through a tough workout and, and, and doing all those things so mm-hmm. there never comes a point where you know I, I don't enjoy those things I don't like the training um, you know, then I'll then I'll hang it up and, and, and not do it anymore. But up until then, you know, I I still feel really good. And and if I, you know, that's another thing. If I didn't feel good, if mm-hmm. I physically my, my body was telling me to, to stop, I'd, I'd have no mm-hmm. problems. You know, I'm not going to hang on. You know, I'd have no problems walking away. I've, right. I've did it a long time, and, and you know, I got a lot to be proud of. So I'd, I'd have no problems walking away, but. I feel great. I feel better now than I did when I started. Mm-hmm. Now, earlier you brought up an interesting point when you said that um, you know you if you you know you'd be okay, you'd be at peace just having those two UFC appearances because you said that you you know you you you've realized that they're really not looking for you know a guy who who's, who's 36 years old when they could have you know a, a much younger guy who's who's you know fresh fresh out of, you know, fresh into his career and, and ha- hasn't had that opportunity to fight there. Um, how long did it take you to, to you know, look yourself in the mirror and say that? Because there's a lot of fighters out there who, you know, maybe are three, four, five, six years older than you who still think that they have that shot. Maybe they, they've been there before or, or haven't been there before and are still hoping to get there. But, um, you know, that's a, a very big step because a lot of these guys wouldn't, be able to say that maybe in a couple of years they'll be saying it, but there's a lot of guys out there older than you who still think they have that chance. You know, when when did you look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, I, I don't know if it's going to happen? Um, you know, it was a few years ago. Actually, I remember it. Um, I, I was talking to Monty, and that's one thing with Monty Cox is he's very honest, mm-hmm. and he, he's got no reason to lie to me. And, and I flat out asked him, you know, if I'm, am I ever going to get back in the UFC? And this was probably. It was before the Bellator run, so it was right. 2011, and he thought, told me probably not. They want a guy that's 25 right. years old and he's got 10 knockouts or 10 wins, and, and nine of them are knockouts. Yeah. And and um, you know, it was just it was a fact of of, of competing. Now, don't get me wrong, if if uh, if things go well yeah. in the future, yeah. and sure. you know, I get a couple, Absolutely. you know, I get a nice little winning streak, and they call it. It's not like I'm not going to say no, yeah. you know, but. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely not my goal at this time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, possibly one of the most fascinating things about your record is that you have 23 knockouts and 23 submissions. That balance there is just, you know, uh, I look at that and that's just very impressive to my eyes. Um, when when someone looks at your record, what is something that, that you're hoping pops out to them? Like, you know, when all when all is said and done and they just look at your record on paper, uh, not, not look at the fights themselves, but when they just look at what you've been able to do uh, over the course of this uh, your career and how many fights you've had, you know, what's the thing that you're hoping will stand out to people? You know, just that, you know, that I was a winner, you know, that I did do well in this, I was successful um, and, and consistency, you know, and 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 kind of like you said, I think I have 23 knockouts, 22 submissions, and 21 or something like that decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I'm well-rounded and, and um, you know, I was able to compete at a pretty high level for a long time. And, and um, you know, just I, I did well in the sport. I was successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Travis, let's change gears a little bit. Let's go uh, to your fight that's coming up on May 24th. You're going to be taking on Brian Heaton. What are your thoughts about him as an opponent? 
Johnny and Ice tough. Um, it's a heavyweight fight, and you know we've we've talked about that. But I probably shouldn't be fighting at heavyweight anymore. But mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I took the fight, and and um, he's experienced. He's he's well rounded. Um, t- tough kid. He's got some decent wins. He beat McCorkle. He's got a couple other decent wins. Um, he moves well for a big guy. Um, and he is a big guy. He's mm-hmm. 270 from what I've heard. Um, it's not an impressive 270, but it, it, it's still 270. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, 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 a, it's a, a tough fight for me. Mm-hmm. Just curious, this fight was supposed to be the main event for Extreme, Extreme Challenge 194. You were supposed to fight him. I believe that was like back in 2011. Um, just curious, why didn't that fight take place? Um, you know, I, I, I remember that, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure why, because um, Extreme Challenge is Monty Cox's show, right. I'm not sure why we didn't go on with it, um, but I do remember it getting canceled, I think I've actually been lined up to fight Brian mm-hmm. two times, maybe even three times, and um, for whatever reason it fell through, so... Um, this is this is a fight that's that's uh, been in the, the making for quite a while. Right, right. This is a fight that, like like you said, ha- has been in the makings for a, w- a long time. And, and this is a fight, I, I interviewed him back in January, and he said that uh, you and Tim Sylvia were the two dream fights he had. So now he's he's getting his wish. He's fighting you on uh, uh, May 24th. Um, now, Brian Heaton, he's a guy who, who's been around for a while, but for whatever reason, he can't seem to get a break. He's had some nice win streaks, but he hasn't been able to get into a big show, and he hasn't been able to fight you know the caliber guys like you. You know, he... he you look at his resume, I think the only guy that he's fought that's fought in Bellator or the UFC was Sean McCorkle, but uh, you know he hasn't really gotten that big break. Um, just curious, why do you think he hasn't gotten uh, a shot in a big show? Is it because uh, you know he, he comes from a very small town, he doesn't really come from the big gym, he, he you know physically you know he's not really that impressive. Uh, you know what, what do you think it is about him? Why do you think he hasn't gotten that shot? Yeah, I think it's you know it's sad to say, but physically, you know, he's not that impressive, and, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, obviously, competing and not just in, in fighting, but um, competing in wrestling as long as I did, I know that it don't matter how you look. I mean, right. I've, I've I've watched a few of Brian's fights, and he moves great for a big guy. I mean, he he moves very well. You know, so it, it doesn't matter how you look. But I think. Um, when it comes to the bigger shows, it does, and then that, that uh, you know, obviously, it, it sucks for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, this fight is going to be for the heavyweight title of Driller Promotions. Um, so, is this five rounds? Correct. Yeah, okay. Five, okay, five rounds, five rounds. Okay, I see, I see. And also, you've been linked to a fight for Dakota FC. I believe that's uh, sometime in June. I want to say June seventh. I don't have it in front of me, but I, I think that's the date. Um, is, is that fight confirmed, or are, are you going to be fighting on that card, or is that still in the works? That's the plan right now. Um, he just sent me the contract today, so I plan to send that back today. Yeah, it's June seventh um, in uh, North Dakota. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously. The things have to go well May 24th. I'm, on, I'm definitely not looking past Brian Hedin, but um, that, that's kind of what I'd like to do is, is fight back to back there the mm-hmm. next couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Now, your opponent for that card is going to be Dallas Mitchell. He just fought Jason Brills at, at 205. Um, is, is that fight going to be a light heavyweight against him, or is uh, he coming it'll up? It'll be a, uh, a catch weight at 220. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Um, a couple more questions before I let you go, Travis. And I really appreciate you uh, for being so liberal with your time. I know you, you got this fight coming up soon, so I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to talk. But uh, just a couple more. Um, your your career um, is still going strong, and and you're you're back on the winning path. Uh, two fights in a row here uh, after you had that losing streak, but you're back on the winning trail here. Um, 
how long realistically do you see yourself continuing to compete in this sport? You know, obviously you've been at it for a very long time, but but you can still do it. And and, and you're you know, for a guy who's been as in the game as long as you have, you're you know still uh, very well put together, very healthy. Um, it, it doesn't seem like you've aged at all. I, I still remember you from the early days, and you, you kind of look the exact same. But uh, you know, how long do you think you still uh, want to compete, and how long do you think that you still have in the sport? You know, I. I I feel great, and, and that's the, the key to it. As long as I feel good, I'm going to continue to do it. Um, you know, so I can't really put on a. I, I can't imagine I'm going to wake up one morning and, and and start feeling old and start mm-hmm. feeling 36 years old. You know, I, I I'm not sure how that how that really works, mm-hmm. but um, you know, I. I I definitely, I'd like to get to a hundred fights. Right. You know, and if if I still feel good, I, I don't. I don't want to lose anymore. So that would be what eighty two and no, eighty one, eighty one and eighteen and one. Is that a hundred? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, something like that. So you know, a hundred fights. Maybe that's that's my goal. I know Severn's got a hundred. Or obviously, Fulton, Severn, Jeremy's probably got a hundred. So you know, that that kind of be a milestone. Mm, I see. I see. Now I'm just curious. Are you a full time fighter, or do you have a second job? No, I. I... Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hey, oh yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Keep okay, going. I was a full time fighter for 12 years, and just this past year, um, I started um, working at a uh, high school here in Minnesota. Um, I work with special needs kids, and uh, I'm just finishing out my first year of doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you know, uh, b- beyond you know, let, let's say in a couple of years, uh, you know, you're retired. Um, w- will you stay in the sport? Will you will you try to get into coaching? Uh, is that something that you see yourself doing? No, probably not. Probably not with mixed martial arts. I'll definitely coach wrestling. Um, I've did that this year, and I'll definitely stick with that. Um, I, I just enjoy that more. Um, I should say no, but I, I don't plan on it. I don't see. I, can't see myself doing it. I'd much rather enjoy coaching wrestling than, than mixed martial arts. Oh. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. Um, Travis, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it was a very long interview, but uh, you know, I just got carried away here. I, I'm so fascinated so by proud, your career, man, awesome. and, and you've been around for a very long time. And I, I've, I've been trying to get you for a very long time, and now that I got you, I just couldn't let you go. So, uh, yeah, uh, re- on, man. Was fun. yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, uh, before I let you go, do you have any sponsors you'd like to thank? And is there anything you'd like to say to the fans? Um. You know, as far as the fans, I just appreciate, you know, everybody still following me and, and um, you know, I still feel really good and continue going to do something, like to do one more run at something big. Um, not really sure what that big thing is, but um like to make one more run at something. Um, so I appreciate, you know, everybody, you know, sticking with and following me and, and um and uh, you know, see if we can do one more little run here. Mm-hmm. Travis, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it, and hey. best of luck coming up on May twenty fourth. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. It was fun.